The next talk will be given by Leonid Evdokimov, and he will be talking about Russia versus Telegram, technical notes on the battle. The stage is yours. Thank you. I am greeting all the creatures in this hall, in the cyberspace, and those who are in the future compared to me saying these words. My name is Leonid Evdokimov, and affiliations that matter for this talk are basically following. First, I love Internet Protocol, and I love measuring networks based on Internet Protocol. Second, I am not a Telegram team member, so no insights. Third, I was a happy Telegram user, and when the blocking started, I was extremely disappointed. Basically, I was disappointed enough to do something. But before describing the Telegram incident, I want uh, to give a brief overview of Russian internet censorship landscape. It will give some important context that may help you to prevent some erratic conclusions. First, attempts to filter Russian internet segment, it's uh, not a recent development. There were some activities in that area for like last 11 years. The first uh, documented incident of internet censorship in Russia happened in May of 2007. Court ordered four ISPs in Novosibirsk uh, Academic Campus, also known as Akadem Gorodok, uh, to ban some extremist websites. Those were small internet service providers, so only a small fraction of users was affected, and the incident hasn't uh, made a loud news story. The razor stream that was used to block content in this ages was named Federal List of Extremist Materials. But the registry was quite badly maintained. For example, one of the entries in that registry is exactly the following. A text document named Terrorism from the folder named Orders Number 1, CD Disk Number 1. That's it. That's the entry of the registry. So, the list wasn't very useful for the purpose of automatic content blocking. One of the notable events of that era is the act of digital resistance by Maxim Mashkov. Uh, Maxim is a cyber librarian of the oldest Russian internet library named Libru. One of the sections of the library is named Samizdat, that basically stands for uh, self-publishing in Russian. And uh, that Samizdat journal hosted user-generated content. Once the domain of the journal was added to the federal list of extremist materials. Of course, that wasn't a surprise, because all Soviet people know that Samizdat is kind of really extreme civil disobedience. Maxim decided to bring some fun or fairness to that case, and he transferred the useless domain to the ministry. So, basically, he pointed the domain of the Samizdat library to the website of the Ministry of Justice. As expected, that eventually caused some inaccessibility of minjust.ru. The modern blacklist... <laughs> the modern blacklist, as we know it, it appeared in 2012. The law was brought to protect children of all ages from 1 or 0 uh, to 100 years old from digital drugs from child porn, and from various safety guidelines, also known as suicide how-tos. The major websites protested, but the parliament didn't care that much. And eventually, the president have signed the law on Saturday. Now I know that the uh, president works on Saturdays. So, how does modern Roskomnadzor blocklist look like? It's an XML find, file signed with detached signature using uh, ghost uh, cryptography. Also, uh, the bundle of XML file and the signature, it is wrapped up in another XML as uh, the file is fetched using SOAP protocol. The protocol documentation is publicly avail available as well as the API endpoints for testing. The essence that you should know is that Internet service providers actually control the filtering equipment they purchase. And Roskomnadzor, it only maintains the blacklist and monitors that filters of internet service providers actually work. So, when the blocklist first appeared in November 2012, it immediately delivered a lot of fun to us. For example, it blocked Absurdopedia, 
uh, basically a Russian version of encyclopedia and exactly for suicide how-to. Of course, the grotesque of blocking of humorous content got some media attention, and some brave creature decided to leak the block list to GitHub to, goodify, to codify that absurd for ages. So, two weeks later, after the first block list, block list release, GitHub and SourceForge got a copy of the block list. And uh, that copy was kept up to date, up to date for years. It's still kept up to date, and it's still maintained. I don't know anyone who knows the person maintaining that block list mirror. So this talk is basically the only way for me to thank that maintainer for all the work he was doing during the last six years. And of course, another fun incident in the same month, like within a few weeks, some of Google services were also banned for a day or so. So anyway, who needs jQuery libraries from jstatic.com? And I can spend the whole time slot of the talk describing funny incidents regarding the block list, but it's not the main topic today. But I can't resist, so I'll just name a few more. First, the Pornhub. Uh, it was a pioneer that used legal procedure to unblock the website that was blocked previously. And that legal fight, it deserves some kudos. Second, uh, Roskomnadzor obviously loves, loves TCP dump, for sure. That's, uh, you know, the only sane way to explain how certificate authority or revocations lists and OCSP responders of Komodo CA were banned. And uh, that CI ban, it caused some quite solid collateral damage and hard to debug problems. Third, Roskomnadzor either have some sense of humor or just lack sanity checks in uh, blacklist maintenance procedures, so it really banned uh, loopback address for a while. As I've earlier said, Roskomnadzor monitors that ISPs actually implement filters. The reason for monitoring is understandable. The law doesn't matter. The fine and the penalty does. So ISPs got some New Year gifts in 2016. Uh, that was a tiny OpenVRT uh, router based on TP-Link platform. Waldix, uh, well-known uh, Russian uh, hacker, uh, has hacked the firmware and highlighted some really nice facts uh, in his research. First, API of the command and control center of those measurement platform, it was reached over HTTPS. Sounds good so far, but unfortunately, CA certificates bundle was absent, probably due to image size constraints. Also. SSH was used to do some reverse tunneling. That sounds like a usual and a good idea to penetrate network's address translation as soon as IPv4 is still widely used uh, and uh, the modern IP is not that much, at least in Russia. But server uh, host K check, it was absent. So it was basically disabled. That allowed Valdix to inject some nice screenshot of cyber garbage into Roskomnadzor monitoring pipeline at least according to his publication. If his prank succeeded, that was the picture that Sensor was seeing in the back office while checking the screenshot of the website that had to be banned. The real issue with the Revisor monitoring system is that it is a black box, at least from ISP's standpoint. It's not publicly documented what sort of behavior uh, the black box has. What sort of filter uh, is good enough, and what sort of filter leads to fines? Eventually, one of maintainers of Revisor system, the government employee, uh, has uh, written a public uh, frequently asked questions for Revisor on GitHub to help ISPs to comply. And he claims that it like, reduced overall amount of fines. That sounds like good activity, but before that, some ISPs had to put that monitoring system, Revisor, into a strict sandbox that uh, had way more tight filters that ordinary users were expecting. And moreover, the sandbox solution was so widely discussed and so popular that it became the logo of semi-official Telegram channel that discussed uh, revisor-related issues between ISPs and like governmental employees. As soon as ISP were first to comply with the black post, as soon as XML file contained stale IP addresses of the websites to block, as soon as the black box was actually using IP addresses from DNS to check for compliance, because all of that, some ISPs started to feed A and 4A records straight from DNS to their filters. And of course, it was prone to some malicious manipulations by domain name owners. 
Though manipulations were called DNS attacks, and there were various sorts of them. Some of ISPs used IP addresses from DNS to actually block traffic. That's boring. But those ISPs have brought their users some collateral damage when domain names were pointed to IP addresses of good services. Other ISPs used IP addresses to steer some portion of traffic towards DPI boxes to reduce overall amount of bandwidth going through DPI. That's very smart, and it saves some electricity, uh, so it's kind of green. Uh, but unfortunately, it may lead to more specific routes overriding ordinary routing rules when domain names were pointing to IP addresses of peering subnets. Or, in the worst case, routers can just go on strike when uh, blacklisted domain names are pointed to something like a million and a half of distinct IP addresses and basically overflow routers become memory. As you can guess, all those incidents have already happened, so no news here. I'm sorry if the history section took too long, but some faults deserve highlighting as they are quite universal across different filtering systems. So the story of incident with Telegram starts here, basically when policemen enter the game. So what's the essence of the reasons to block Telegram? It's quite easy to understand. Terrorists who plot the bomb in St. Petersburg subway, they use Telegram. Um, also, every ISIS member enjoys slick UI, nice stickers, and videos in circles, according to news and Russian satirical videos. Some people also name popularity of Telegram in opposition groups as a reason for ban. But, you know, discussing the reason of ban is out of the scope of the talk anyway. So, it's easy. Telegram is added to the registry of information distributors, so it has to comply with the law, and it has to do some decryption, schmickryption magic, uh, basically to help police, and otherwise it will be blocked. So, when the telegram was duly added to the corresponding registry in the classified location, uh, it claimed that it will never hand over keys or do backdoors. So, digital rights NGO called Roskom Svoboda started leading campaign for encryption and stuff. And uh, eventually the court cases were lost, at least in Russian courts. The case was escalated further, but it's boring legal stuff. Uh, so the key point is, on the 16th of April, Roskomnadzor started to block Telegram. And following a few weeks uh, were named the first Russian civil cyber war. Uh, but let me give me a bit more context. Telegram wasn't the first messenger that terrorists love. Zello was another one. Zello was also used by protesting truck drivers in Russia. But maybe those drivers were meant to be the terrorists. Who knows? Anyway, once again, out of the scope. So, attempts to block Zello were ongoing since April 2017. And uh, they weren't a complete success. And there was a leak in the end of March 2018 saying that Roskomnadzor plans to conduct an experiment uh, to test new tactics regarding blocking of Zello. The leaked paper, it had 36 subnets summing down to something like 15 uh, millions of IP addresses of Amazon and other cloud providers. And the leak had like nice keywords like null routing, BGP, redistribute. You all know that you have already seen it before. So I'm unsure what they actually meant uh, with that experiment. And I don't know if the leak was genuine, but that publication of leak caused a lot of noise in the media. And uh, there were no further reports that could confirm of existence of a like experiment. So maybe media worked. Moreover, some illustrators drew really good pictures that could clearly communicate the overall Roskomnadzor plan regarding attempts to ban Zello to every, I don't know, to no technical granny, for example. So back to Telegram. On Monday, April the 16th, Roskomnadzor starts to ban Telegram subnets some of Telegram subnets. As expected, uh, no significant effect in those nodes. So, Roskomnadzor went berserk and started banning Amazon. But Telegram worked. Finally, Roskomnadzor noticed that one of uh, Telegram subnets wasn't banned initially, yet. And of course, that didn't help them much to achieve the goal when they banned it. So, berserk mode wasn't turned off, and almost two uh, million of IP addresses were banned by the end of the day. Telegram was doing fine, but overall internet wasn't. I mean, like, from Russia. 
or internet was okay. But people uh, in Russia were complaining a lot about Instagram, about Steam, about World of Tanks, World of Ships, Twitch, YouTube, Google, Gmail, and so on. So basically everyone was swearing at Roskomnadzor by the end of the first day of civil cyber war. But actually everyone stopped swearing the next day when the amount of banned IP addresses increased tenfold. Everyone was just speechless. There were no good swear words to express the amount of frustration. And uh, every other online tool was bro bro broken, basically. More millions of domains were affected. And uh, in the meantime, Roskomnadzor was announcing that no socially significant web services were affected. Of course, I don't blame Roskomnadzor for mistakes in their announcements, like Employees implementing the ban were obviously very, very tired and stressed uh, while rushing to shut down Telegram. And uh, they were in such a rush that uh, they have banned several IP ranges twice, uh, submitting overlapping subnets into digitally signed block list uh, on the second day of the civil cyber war on the 17th of April. And um, probably the equipment could handle that, the filters. But some people counting public statistics for the block list, they got their numbers wrong because of that. But if sanity checks are missing, they are missing everywhere. So some malformed URLs were added to the block list as well during the incident. And the malformed URL, it actually caused some filter implementations to fail ingestion of new block list entries, new block list subnets, and new block list IP addresses. But I think that it probably was just a mistake. I don't expect that it was carefully planned sabotage of some Roskomnadzor employee. During the first days of cyber war, Roskomnadzor has distributed a document with some whitelist of socially significant services, uh, including Google, by the way. That included websites also like Kremlin Roo. Uh, those shouldn't be banned under any circumstances. Probably that was a response to numerous reports regarding collateral damage, but unfortunately, uh, Roskomnadzor had no legal framework for like actions. So many ISPs just ignored the document. But it had caused some media wave as soon as the whitelist coming from censorship agency was something new for Russia that day. Anyway, the mantra regarding socially significant services was repeated over and over again. But like counter of Yandex Metrica or Yandex Banner system endpoints were banned in the midnight of April the 27th. And uh, Vikontakte was also banned by same commit. And Vikontakte is the most popular social network in Russia. So the incident lasted for almost two hours. And it clearly showed that, first, Roskomnadzor works selflessly, round the clock. Second, Roskomnadzor still loves to speed up and still loves to feed IP addresses right into the blacklist without much analysis as it previously happened with Komodo CA. In addition to generic mantras regarding socially significant websites, Roskomnadzor was spreading quite precise statements in their newsfeed as well. One of the statements claimed that IP addresses of Google Play, Google Drive, Google.ru were not banned. Of course, we, Azure 2 Club, uh, Azure 2 Club sorry, uh, were very happy to hear that. The reason is crystal clear. Uh, precise statements are refutable. And it's always fun to refuse official news, uh, to refute official news coming from official news source uh, in fake news era. Uh, so we scraped hundreds of IPs of various Google domains sending different client subnets to Google's name servers, checked collected IPs against blacklist, and you know, media loves fake news stories. And it was kind of interesting that there was uh, more than one cluster of interconnected Google domains pointing to the same IPs. Probably that makes some sense from traffic engineering perspective, but it also explains the reason for some Google fonts and points being unreachable while others were perfectly okay. But it wasn't the only fun visualization we made. Like on the April the 19th, we took the ripe atlas probes in Russia that uh, absurd filtering, pointing them to randomly selected TLS endpoints in filtered subnets and crafted live uh, Vecamol dashboard. That dashboard showed that some ISPs are basically practicing digital resistance. Um, the reason to, click, uh, to create a like dashboard was clear for me. I didn't want for huge ISPs, those are too big to fail, uh, to use the possibility of non-compliance as a competitive advantage against smaller independent ISPs who can't take the risk of paying fines. 
Um, but members of ISP community asked us to hide the dashboard within something like half an hour. I, for the reason I still don't quite understand. And uh, anyway, non-compliance story still goes on, at least for Ross Telecom, the largest ISP that holds like one third of a B2C broadband market share. And experiments have shown that Ross Telecom doesn't block traffic to blacklisted IPs and subnets completely. It blocks just HTTP and HTTPS traffic. And for example, SSH works, SSH works perfectly. And once again, that's state-owned uh, ISP holding one, one third of a market, you know? Like here is an example of non-compliance or basically delayed compliance I'm speaking about. The blocking, blue dots close to zero, it was delayed by something like five days uh, while they uh, have to implement the blocking basically as soon as possible or within 24 hours, depending on various variables in the XML file. So, like, unblocking was perfectly timely. As the uh, civil cyber war continues, people use proxies and Tor to assess Telegram, and uh, they get indicated, and artists uh, craft party songs about proxies, they mock Roskomnadzor, and people have great share of fun. But Roskomnadzor hunts proxies as well as Telegram, and people wonder how they do it. Some people start suspecting that lawful interception equipment, also known as SORM, is used to hunt proxies, and tips come via public and private channels, highlighting instances of alike sniffers. Basically, the instances were exposing traffic statistics publicly, and the traffic statistics uh, also had a section of Telegram traffic uh, that attracts the attention, attention of people who send us some tips. Uh, we scraped statistics page, and it turned out that all those instances were pumping quite small amount of traffic, something like 20 gigabits per second. But the shape of the traffic looked like a real one. We looked up those instances using Shodan, and uh, we have seen that some instances had public FTP repositories with SORM binaries, basically. Uh, and uh, what was significantly worse, some instances were leaking actual uh, users' click stream and some personal information like MAC addresses or logins. And of course, all the data was available without any authentication. So being good citizens, we decided to report the incident to the vendor of SOAR equipment and uh, ISPs hosting the lawful interception equipment. I got no replies, but some instances were like properly secured within the next few weeks, but some weren't. Anyway, we concluded that the tips we got, it they had no public evidence that SORM equipment was actually used to hunt Telegram and proxies. Stati at least statistical counters about Telegram, they were zero because, you know, subnets are blocked. But you also know that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Another Telegram story is that is kind of interesting is that the protest meetings happened when the app was blocked. As far as I know, it is the very first time in Russia when protest meetings uh, are triggered by blocking of online service. Um, the meeting was scheduled on the last day of April and the first uh, day of May in Moscow and St. Petersburg. On the 28th, and on the, 28th uh, the Saturday uh, before the meeting, the uh, number of blocked IP addresses went down from 90 million to 15. So it's unclear if the action is caused by the activity of the society, but maybe it's just a coincidence. I don't know. But we assumed that media, media attention may help to reduce collateral damage caused by massive subnet blocking. And we decided to do some performance. I have previously described DNS attacks that caused a major outage of Trans Telecom Internet Service Provider. And uh, one of the outcomes of that incident was a chart that was monitoring the account of IP addresses that are pointed by blacklisted DNS entries. Basically, if the chart, chart skyrockets, it may be an indicator that uh, ongoing DNS attack I have previously registered some expired blacklisted domains for network measurements uh, to present the results of those measurements at the round table of the parliament. And those domains were still alive. So I took some of them and added some dynamic DNS zone script. And the script was updating the zone, so nice Morse code appeared on the chart. And the plotted phrase, phrase was like digital resistance. Unfortunately, it hadn't triggered any visible actions from Roskomnadzor. 
But another reason that could uh, explain that is what the performance could be linked to Alexei Navalny's opposition uh, meeting. Uh, they had uh, some protest on the 5th of May. So we took that as a hypothesis and continued. First, some cheap drama was added. The chart was doing countdown from 5 to 0. Um, and it uh, was doing it very slowly, and fake drama kind of worked. The countdown has triggered uh, some nervousness, and the message was as friendly as possible. Russia celebrates uh, Radio Day on the 7th of May. That's a professional holiday for all the people involved in uh, telecommunication, and the message was truly pop-off. That is a well-known celebration uh, greeting for that holiday that basically follows Paschal greeting pattern. And that message, it uh, had some effect. Roskomnadzor started to clean up domains from the block list while the end of transmission chart was plowed. It caused some nice fade out, but also Roskomnadzor uh, has uh, banned and unbanned uh, like ampersand TLD. Maybe it was a sign of unity and solidarity, I don't know. And second, amount of banned IP address dropped significantly. Uh, third, uh, Roskomnadzor started to remove expired domains from the registry, reducing possible impact of various DNS attacks. So, uh, it was maybe a hype-driven cleanup, but the proper expired domains maintenance persisted. And it was good for overall network stability. Maybe it was a coincidence, I don't know. Another unblocking happened on the 8th of June, and uh, Anyway, all those cleanups were followed by people uh, computing the statistics of IP addresses that were remaining banned after subnet unban. And the number was less than 1%. And so some people were saying that Roskomnadzor was using uh, terrorist tactics while fighting with terrorists using Telegram, uh, basically taking those networks as hostages. I had an assumption that leftovers of collateral damage could be also explained by something like incompetence or lack of big players in those subnets. So I've spent days mining open data on DNS, written an open letter to Roskomnadzor giving off overview of blocked web resources, like Slack, GC, PowerDNS, Doodle, Python mailing list, Netlify, and so on and so forth, and uh, American uh, Nigilist Underground Society, anas.com. And the letter was also duly sent to corresponding legal online form of Roskomnadzor. Some answer arrived, but it was like, pointless legal speak. So maybe those networks are really hold as hostages. I don't know. So uh, that was a brief story of heated part of the civil cyber war. But the cyber war wasn't over. It became colder. One of the observations we made was a selective uh, protocol throttling. Telegram uh, clients picked several protocols to the proxy. SOX5 and variations of uh, Telegram-specific look like nothing empty proto protocol. And I discovered that one of major mobile broadband ISPs doesn't treat those protocols equally. At first, I assumed that all look like nothing protocols were shaped as of 4 pluggable transport and bare netcat u random. Uh, they were throttled as well. But thanks to Simon Basso, we've conducted an experiment and confirmed that it's not the case, that HTTP protocol that is XORed with RC4 random stream, it was also absolutely OK. It's unclear if the shaper is uh, targeting specifically empty protor or like some other protocol, but it's definitely more complex than uh, I originally assumed. But it also means that camouflage matters a lot while designing pluggable transport. Another proxy server availability, availability issue uh, was observed uh, in one of Ross Telecom subnets in the south of Russia. Empty proto proxies operating without random padding were banned uh, almost instantly. And uh, it was trivial to trigger DPI equipment into resetting the TCP stream, just sending the packets of the, to the listening TCP port. Uh, but there was a thing that was really bad in that setup. Uh, the IP end port of the network uh, endpoint were added to dynamic block list at the DPI box at, for a couple of hours. And uh, we assumed that uh, the uh, vulnerability that was created by that, uh, it could be possibly exploited even from the JavaScript from browsers uh, to ban good web resources, basically. So we decided to disclose that shady practice immediately instead of researching it further. And there was a Reuters news article a couple of months later that kind of confirmed that uh, like experiments on live traffic were actually happening. Um, it's unclear to me if like uh, experiments are legal, but some people consider that it's like crime. Another proxy server's availability issue was observed in Moscow, thanks to St. Petersburg CTF team. They dissected the story. First, the user connects to SOX5 server, then a map scanner comes uh, in something like half an hour, 
And uh, the, if a port is available, like uh, the scanner tries to establish a SOX5 connection to Telegram cloud, uh, and if all the checks are OK, then IP address becomes blacklisted. Um, the story has attracted some non-zero media attention uh, from local and international media, but the most interesting part of the story was left unnoticed. The only reason for me to replicate the study in Moscow subway was the ability to manipulate the block test and add the IP addresses of my own servers to it. It allowed me to con conduct an experiment uh, that I consider extremely important. Uh, we were able to measure the timeline of block list rollout using diverse set of RIPALS props. And, um, Statistics we got uh, was very interesting. It allowed us to verify the tip that we got in May. And the tip was basically saying that uh, there are actually two tiers of ISPs with regards of timing of block list execution. So there are ISPs that start blocking IP address before officially signed uh, XML block list is delivered with API. My personal opinion is that it's not necessary crime. There are other sources of blacklisted endpoints, for example, Federal List of Extremist Materials. Also, Digital Security Lab Ukraine reported that Crimea has both regional blacklist and federal blacklist, but I know nothing on that region. Go ask Xenia, who may be in this room as well. And uh, also, uh, there were like tips coming from Caucasus uh, regarding the like stuff. And, but the thing that you know for sure with high level of confidence is that some regional governmental internet blackout happened in Ingushetia uh, this autumn during protest. Another thing we know that uh, the race between ISPs to block uh, is still persists. Anyway, Russia is federation. And that's almost it. As you may already know, whole Russian history can be su summed up into five words. And then things got worse. And uh, there was a law introduced to the parliament two weeks ago. The law says that Roskomnadzor will give some ISPs anti-turret equipment for free, and that the chosen ISPs must comply and employ it. They can't refuse that New Year gift. And that anti-turret equipment will be acting as filter as well. As soon as ISPs deploying the anti-turret filter don't have to buy their own filters. And there is a thing that is scary to me. The note says that Roskomnadzor will be able to control basically routing and DNS directly. And it's scary twice. First, we have already seen the level of technical competence and lack of safety checks and safeguards. I mean, all the aforementioned mistakes. And second, it's huge centralization of controlling power that can be abused without any transparency. I assume that the luxury of signed XML blacklists will be gone soon. The law also introduced a registry of legal internet exchanges and list of legal cables crossing the border to make absolutely sure that Russia is well connected. Um, so it goes. I'd like to thank lots of people and groups who made this talk possible. Philip Kulin, Valdix, Michael Klimarov, Dmitry Nazarov, Alex Rudenko, Dmitry Belavsky, Vartan Kachaturov, Dmitry Moskin, Dmitry Morozovsky, Simon Basso, Maria Xino, Moritz Bratl, Leak to Blacklist Maintainer, St. Petersburg CTF team, Roskom Svoboda NGO, Digital Resistance Measurement Squadron, the one who is to blame, all the Revisor System funds, NAG community, RIPE Atlas and to all the relatives and colleagues who helped me to survive while doing all the stuff, sometimes quite nervously and round the clock. And of course, I'd like to say uh, to thank stubbornness of Pavel Durov and law enforcement bodies, because that fight made all the great entertainment possible. And I hope the story was entertaining with you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Leonid, for the excellent talk. Uh, we have five minutes left for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, come up to the microphones that are standing in the aisle and to the left and the right and um, wait for my signal. Microphone one, please. Uh, hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, during the whole blocking situation, I heard that Telegram continued working in Russia. Do you know if it uh, works r right now? Yeah, it, it works perfectly. Like, there are some ISPs uh, that are maybe over-complying, and it uh, works a bit less good there, but proxies work, Telegram works. For example, like uh, Rostelecom, uh, as I have previously mentioned, doesn't comply with uh, subnets, and Telegram works flawlessly there. We also have a question from the internet. Signal Angel, please. 
Yes, um, somebody saying on the internet that Telegram had a canary statement on their privacy page stating that no data had been disclosed to any third parties, including governments, and they say the statement has disappeared. Are you aware of that and what do you think about that? Uh, I'm First, I'm not aware of that, and second, uh, mm, I think that is like not a... Or real, like, 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 I don't think that we should be paranoid regarding that because, like, my expectation is that it's just another mistake because, like, Telegram team uh, had, like, I don't know, they write some questionable parts of the software. For example, uh, Telegram client has no proper exponential back off, and uh, it can basically DDoS a proxy in case of in case of some DPI configurations. So, I don't know. I think it was just a uh, mistake by Telegram uh, webmaster. But maybe it's, maybe it's not. Don't know. Anyway, I'm not part of a team. Microphone four, please. If you're worried by the lack of competency, should you work for the Russian government? Mm, I don't know. Maybe. Anyway, I, I still live in Russia. Like, there are lots of beautiful people there. And uh, like, I don't know. I don't think that it is the uh, worst government we had during the last century. So things are... Sometimes they get worse, sometimes they get better. And I'm not sure where we actually are. But some of my friends are paranoid and they basically seek for political asylum. Some of my friends are quite happy to live in Russia. I don't know. Number six over there, please. Yeah, hello, Leonid. Uh, thanks for your amazing talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I was just asking, um, we, as a, as a German people, can we rent your expertise when we get some problems like uh, serious blocking over here in Central Europe? Mm -hmm. Is it possible? Well, like uh, the main point to, uh, for my talk was not to complain about Roskomnadzor, but basically to highlight uh, the cases uh, when things can go wrong uh, because of internet filters. And so that was the point. I'm not 100% sure if it like, completely answers the qu your question, but I think it does. A mic microphone two, please. I, uh, why do you think uh, China is more successful in uh, censoring the internet than Russia? Uh, so the question is, uh, why China is more successful regarding censoring the internet? Uh, I'm not sure that China actually is uh, technically more successful uh, in internet censorship. Maybe it is, but the uh, really important point is that uh, there are a lot of Chinese people speaking Chinese language, and they have a huge ecosystem of Chinese internet that serves the purpose of uh, basically a billion of people. Russia is uh, 10 times smaller. It's a significantly smaller market. Uh, we have uh, some uh, great local content, but amount of local content uh, can't be compared uh, to uh, China. So maybe Chinese people don't uh, need to circumvent censorship that much. And maybe that's why the China is seen as more successful. And uh, like uh, a fr friend of mine works with uh, Chinese factories. Uh, and uh, like uh, while they are traveling to China, they say that circumvention is not a problem. Like everyone who wants to circumvent the filtering in China, he does it trivially. I don't know. I don't travel to China. But I trust those who do. Microphone one, please. Hi, Leonid. Thank you for your interesting work. One question for me would be, did you face any problems through this work with authorities or services that mm. somehow felt offended or attacked? Uh, I wouldn't say attacked. Like uh, I have uh, some FSB officers uh, in uh, my WhatsApp phone book uh, uh, who were like, uh, talking to me, asking uh, to educate them uh, on basically to give them a lecture on like Tor network or something like that. And uh, it wasn't like offensive at all, like they were friendly and why not? I think that education of law enforcement is really important because like law enforcement is doing not only like, I don't know, oppression, but also a lot of dirty work that has to be done somehow. And uh, I don't know, I, I, so far I'm okay. Maybe, maybe I'll overcome the line eventually, but I don't know. That's One it. final question, microphone four, please. Hi, Leonid, and thank you for the talk very much. 
Uh, I heard a popular opinion that after the stock, it's better for you not to come in back in Russia. Uh, sorry, can you repeat, repeat please? Uh, it's better for you not to come back to Russia after your talk here. Well, so my th 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 there is such an opinion, and like uh, when I was uh, doing that prank with Morse code, uh, uh, I uh, got a message from a person from Roskomnadzor using Telegram uh, that said that I shouldn't come back, and I was basically coming back from Belarus to Russia, and I don't know, no one had uh, met me. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I'm okay. quite optimistic. Let's thank the courage of Leonid again, and thank you for your excellent talk. <laughs>